So, The Painted Bird by Jerzy Kaczynski is a 1965 book um, that it's been described as like semi-autobiographical, drawn from um, most of Kaczynski's own childhood. Um, he was born, I think, in the early 30s, and he had a pretty troubled, like, definitely like a kind of turbulent childhood because he was uh, a Polish born, and obviously he was born into this war-torn Central Europe, um, really heard all over the world. Um, when you think about, like, the ramifications of just how how much that war echoed, echoed through the world, and, um, I mean, it's called World War II for a reason. Um, and he was born into this kind of, uh, you know, ravished, he's seeing his own land and the farm land and everything just completely, you know, in disarray. And some of the, these things, uh, he drew criticism, which I'm going to try to elaborate on later, about how much of this, the events were actually real, uh, like, faithful, uh, fallible, you know, infallible accounts of his own life, but he did, in the afterward, um, say a lot, you know, he did, you know, detail and say, like, he was trying to be upfront as he could to say that, you know, these are, you know, not actual, you know, totally 100% verificate, you know, verifiable events. Like, some of these things were, you know, mic or kind of mixed things, and a lot of these things are, it, it takes, like, the myth of uh, folklore and gypsy myth. Uh, I mean, it concerns this, you know, a very young I want to say six-year-old kid. Um, we don't. I don't think we know his name. It's a kind of an unnamed narrator. So, but it's his account, looking in hindsight, at um, in 1939. So, right when the war was beginning in Europe, at least. Um, so, basically, the whole entire, I guess, Eastern Front. Uh, my um, history, my exact historicity of what I know about the war is like a little bit, um, very, very, not really that, <laughs> not that uh, adequate. But I do know that there was, it has some holes in it, but I do know that that's definitely about the time that Nazi Germany would have been, in, you know, basically, you know, rummaging through all these different um, and varying layers of uh, intensity, you know, going through all these lands and pillaging. And uh, what happens is that the boy is a um, born to, I think, Nazi uh, collaborators. They were... or at least accused of being Nazi. So you, the whole entire thing, you have this child, this kind of, um, you know, this little kid that's basically bereft of his own parents and he doesn't know whether they're alive the whole entire time with the duration of the war and spoiler alert until the end of the, the, the novel when they when he reunites with them. But for the most part, like he's left, left in the dark about them. Like they don't, you don't know like the extent of their um, conspiracy with them or even if they were truly Nazi, but they do have reason to be fearful of what, you know, those, the, the, um, of, you know, what the, um, their comeuppance might be. So they're, you know, they, uh, hide him in this, like, um, kind of peasant area village in this, like, kind of, uh, um, undercover of, like, uh, maybe a barn or something like that. And just the whole while, there's this, like, you know, just like awful things happening not just on account of the like nazi soldiers or like even the um and we haven't even got to the soviet side of the war yet but yeah um but the whole while there's just like horrible things happening in the in this little village that's you know there's like uh this like horribly detailed um account of how a farmer gouges out at the eyes of a peasant boy of plow boy i think and then like you know basically lashes him and whips him and beats him um you know there's uh rapes and there's just uh lots of nasty <laughs> you know um unsettling things happening in this thing and he's trying to find kind of solace from all this and then the boy ends up running into the hands of while he's running from one of these kind of um you know one of these irate farmers that are you know basically trying to use him as basically like you know basically who none of them kind of he's like this kid i feel like is kind of a hot potato um some of this reminded me like um a bit like um come and see or you know based off the novel originally by belarus not um man who actually survived um the invasion you know the when the uh germans and operation barbarossa i believe just like completely went all out on invading Russia 
and all the Slavic territorial areas like Belarus and I think Ukraine and um, Poland was kind of not too far from there so I guess this does tie in a little bit but yeah there's just a lot of um, horrendous things by both sides of the year you know like the Soviets you know obviously they starve their own <laughs> people to death and they work their people to, to the bone um, and they also you know with the Ukrainian you know genocide as well like that all this stuff is like you know um, <laughs> it's uh, well it's in the past and it's bridge in the hopefully water under the bridge um, there are a lot of different, uh, just, <laughs> there's just like an ugliness factor to all this. So, it, and this kind of is the kind of landscape that this unfortunate boy is, you know, thrown into. And he's like trying to navigate his way through, um, terror and dread and just like trying to avoid them himself. But like, obviously him, he himself, the kid is just like thrust into these things as well. Not really, not, uh, Definitely, mostly in part because of his uh, dark hair and kind of gypsy complexion. There's a old thing about the evil eye that I think uh, m most of us heard about before, um, but vaguely kind of thrown around in a kind of jovial manner. But this was people actually in this particular village. There's this. He falls into the hands of Olga, this woman who uh, about middle age, I suppose, who's uh, takes care of him but is also skeptical and wary of him because he has this dark hair and thinks he has like gypsy powers or like the ability to curse her. And there's a lot of, I don't want to just write it off as superstition, but definitely a lot of really heady uh, spells and magic and different uh, little um, like inner type of, uh, I don't know what you would call it exactly, but kind of a very um, almost like theosophic kind of, folk magic and, or folk psychology or folk wisdom to these um, little peasant villages because they're kind of so kind of <laughs> secluded away from society enough that they kind of have to, you know, make up their mind or find their own way of gauging or, um, you know, what, what, what exactly, you know, th you know, things work or reality works. Like they don't, they don't quite get the natural world still. Um, and there, there are, you know, obviously villages in uh, Russia that were like so far off like certain tribes of the old believers I think they're called and these types of people um you know uh, from what I've heard were so kind of like far away from separated from society that the or from the world and what was going out in the outside world that they didn't even know that the world was at war like twice you know so they missed both those um probably for the better though um but yeah um yeah, this kind of reminded me a bit of that. But yeah, this boy, he's just, yeah, just completely, you know, eventually he's um, put into the hands of, so some of these, uh, yeah, weird magic spells they have, like some of them are like, you must, you know, it's it's told that it's bad luck if, you know, a, somebody spits three times after purchasing a, purchasing a heifer or something like that, or, you know, like something like, or um, purging yourself of bad luck, stuff like that, or, uh, putting bad luck on other people like they th they think these things and it's easy to write them off and be like haha they're so superstitious idiotic like they're just gonna fall for anything but in actuality like you don't know the I guess maybe this is the part where I'm, I'm not quite sure how much of this because a part of me feels like some of this is going into the magic realism territory because there'd be moments when magic realism would show up in instances like the boys like running away from you know and then there's crows after him and i'm like thinking like wait these crows have the power to kind of i guess uh torment him too but like it seems like the, when there's moments of like spells of um the fantis the fantastical i guess or the phantasmagorical um much of the time it doesn't do anything much to alleviate the horror of and if, if anything it exacerbates it and I think that's like a bit of what the strain, the issue I have personally with the book is that it dwells too much. It is like necessarily, it is like markedly focused and just not holding back on like how awful things are for this kid. Um, and the whole time it's like, I feel like as a narr as you know, separating myself from the work, like I, or if in a way to actually look at it objectively, but I, I, I do know that these part of these were his own experiences. Um, but I do know that Kaczynski himself wasn't um, separated from his parents and he wasn't 
uh, so things weren't as bad. And he says that, you know, he, he makes sure that's uh, clear abundantly in the afterward. But the whole time I can't get the sense that he's using the kid as like the characters in this as like punching bags. Um, either there's <laughs> the kid being the punching bag himself or the people inflicting the damage on the kid. Whether it's the, the pastor, preacher guy that, you know, um, like turns like the village against him because they're, you know, because they think he's like, you know, he, the, nowhere does he go, does he fit in? Like, is it like the, the even like the, the folk peasant people like don't like him because they're skeptical of his hair or the dark hair, or the, you know, the, the, even, you know, like, but the religious people start like saying like, you were going to burn in hell for this or that. And it's just like, Jesus, there's so much, it's just wherever he goes, it's just like endless. Yeah. So anyway, um, the kid at this point, um, yeah, he gets in, into the hands of a local carpenter, I think, at one of the thing, at one of the villages. Um, at this point, I'm not sure exactly where this are because you know, Poland itself, you know, sometimes it's like uh, geographically it borders on Czechia or Czech, the Czech Republic, Czech Communist, I think, Republic nowadays, um, or you know, I think Warsaw's more on the side of like closer to Ukraine. I could be wrong. Uh, that's, you know, like obviously the Warsaw Uprising was a big game changer for the um, kind of like the the Jewish kind of uh, ghetto, crack, you know, a lot of people in the crack code ghetto or the Warsaw ghettos and all of them just like decided to just one day just, you know, stand up to all the Nazi guards and the Gestapo. Um, and yeah, they, they put, up, put up a really big good fight, you know, like a really consider that they were starved for the last point. But then they realized at this point that they were like, we're starving our own resource. Like we're trying to make that the Nazi germ, like the Germans were, again, this is just my kind of waxing poetic rather than historically. Um, they were so like fixated on uh, the war effort and like pushing, you know, uh, trying to like make this kind of like warped version of like a Nietzsche and Ubermount munch that Napoleonic kind of great men, right? Um, to go throughout, sweep throughout Europe and just take take over these places at any uh, any cost necessary, like whatever. Uh, you know, like just sub, sub make everybody else subservient to this ideal. Yet at the same time, they are also killing them, their own supply. Like they were killing their own, you know, slave labor force. It's like they were, you know, beating them to death too. So it's a very conflicted kind of weird Freudian kind of death drive, I guess, because they... They're, you know, if you were thinking about it, if they had any, I guess the point is that none of, nothing what they were doing was really rational, you know, or maybe too rational. Maybe they, you know, in a kind of Darwinian aspect of just maybe it's too much uh, materialistic kind of. Um, but yeah, at this point, too, there is a, um, the boy is, I think there's some, um, it's confusing to what happens. There's a lot of, you know, gang rapes and tortures and um he seems to just kind of sift out and when to wandering and drifting from one village to the next and eventually he ends up in the hands there's the so, so the namesake of this the there is a character that is a bird catcher um by trade and uh he he details his um one of his uh, uh, like a uh, uh kind of not even a guilty but pleasure, but like a kind of open kind of uh, um, delight he takes in catching certain birds and uh, by not only by, but by basically painting, catching a bird and then painting it a different color. Um, and you, everybody know, you know, since kindergarten knows that hey, birds of a certain feather, feather flock together, you know, all these different, you know, birds with this like, you know, like colors, you know, kind of assimilate into the same group. So, um, so basically, he paints these birds like one color, like a different divergent color, and then he sends them back out into the sky, and then what happens essentially is that all the other birds attack this bird because of it seeing it, they seeing it as a threat. It's like not one of them, so that ends up back down dead, and they end up fighting over it, and you can cause it causes a huge uh, uproar. So that is, I guess, like that pretty much is like indicative it's one of the subtext of this is the underlying subtext is that because this gypsy boy is uh, which i really love i love that analogy it's very it's quite like tragically beautiful um but yeah there's it's because this boy is 
thrust into this these circumstances. Nobody wants to take him in. He's like, like I said, a hot potato. He goes from one tribe to the next, and and because he's not exactly like them, or you know, uh, whether surface level layer or just on you know on the surface level of just his hair or his skin or whatever, um, or whether it was um, because he's you know, so it's just something uh, inherently wrong with him. Nobody wants to take him in. So what happens near the end is that he's um, finally reunited with his parents after they find him when the war is over, pretty much. Obviously, Nazi Germany ex exhausted all their resources. Um, and yeah, he finally gets in you know, the arms and then he's like, you know, like the, the ending is pretty beautiful. Um, I won't lie, there's some parts that were pretty difficult to get through. Um, cause it was just like one thing after the other. It was just like a one horrendous, um, kind of experience that, you know, that you thought would end there. It'd be like, okay, is that, that has to be the worst thing ever. And then it goes on the next thing. So yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I'd say like on, on a whole, like I did appreciate the novel, at least for what Kaczynski is trying to put forth. He's not, you know, he's kind of just putting it as it is. He's not trying to say this is an accurate, you know, complete historic, you know, historical, um, you know, infallible look into or account of the war and the events and the chronology. It's obviously through the eyes of an artist slash uh, maybe more, dare say, of a poet, um, somebody who's kind of sees events and then kind of skewers them a little t and sees time not as this kind of orthogonal kind of chronological, you know, sequence of events, but, you know, as kind of moments where, you know, that you walk away kind of, you know, knowing that, not knowing, I guess, the, imper the pertinence of certain events until later, and then, you know, just certain things that happen, you know, like we always remember the possibly the worst parts of our lives or, or, you know, moments that were painful for us, we might think, uh, you know, might pale in comparison to moments that are actually more euphoric or delight or, or, um, enjoyable. So, um, yeah, I get that part, but, um, and I have even more, res more respect for Kaczynski after he told in the afterward that he, <sighs> the certain ramifications he faced for writing The Painted Bird, like he was, um, men, two men showed up at his house. I think he did emigrate not long after the war. Um, again, I, I haven't read too many biographies of him yet. I've, I've only kind of skimmed through one, I think. Um, and it, I think he emigrated into the U.S. shortly after the war. So um, maybe, like, maybe in his, like, teens or maybe 20s. I'm not too sure. But he did live in, I believe, New York or New Jersey to the duration of his life. Um, and, yeah, there was these two men that went into his house and they had, you know, pipes and weapons and they were basically threatening to, you know, to beat him up if, you know, because they were so infuriated about what he said in this book. And then he was like telling them like, I don't, you know, like this, this photo right here that you see, that's my cousin. And then basically he actually kind of turned the tables on them because he had himself had a pistol kind of hidden behind some, some, uh, a vase somewhere, I think. And then he was like, took it out and then was like, you know, kind of you know, basically took pictures to, like, send, you know, threaten them if they ever threatened him, or, you know, threatened him again that he would actually send them to the, you know, send those to the law enforcement or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that was interesting that he was a uh, little bit sad, you know, just to hear how, you know, certain things, like, people, like, people look at certain literature as Sam's dot and, like, is unsay or you can't, you know, and, you know, the classic example, like, Salman Rushdie, the Satanic Verses, where the legend pertaining to the book being banned in all these countries in Arabic and uh, Islamic and people, um, seeing it as, you know, uh, as an ought, a fatwa, you know, like, a fatwa to, like, call for his death, certain, you know, like, really extreme things, um, and that, where, to the point where, like, yeah, like, the, <laughs> the, legacy of the impact of the book takes on, takes more than the actual critical analysis of the book of people reading the book because i've read the book and i was just kind of like kind of lost and at a loss of how to take it but if you look up any books on youtube for example like any anybody actually like looking up to review the book and be like this is what happens in the satanic crush say satanic verses 
nobody, rarely, or barely anybody has like an actual just review on it. So that's interesting. And I'm kind of too scared too because I really didn't feel like I integrated or took that much from the book. I felt like it was a little bit too magic realism. And, um, but yeah, there's, you know, books that are, you know, famously banned that have that kind of thing. But I felt like this was actually stood on its own terms as a book. It was just a little bit too, um, just like brutal, you know, just like, no, there didn't seem to be much, if any, um, kind of like, hey, let's go on to, you know, the peaks and the valleys. And I, I know it's hard when you're, if this, these are true events of the war, that's another thing, because Kaczynski said, you know, these are true events that, you know, not not just him, but affected other people too, worse off that he, than he, um, like people that never saw their parents again, you know, people, uh, you know, accused of kind of um, helping out the other side and, you know, and, you know, the punitive measures taken to deal with them. And yeah, just the inhumanity on a whole um, and just how, even though this was, you know, 20 years, a good 20 years after the war, you know, like how those, those scars pervade or persist. And Kaczynski too, like he took his own life. Uh, I recently heard, uh, I think he tried overdosing, I believe, on alcohol and like a bunch of pills, I believe, like sleeping pills. And yeah, he just took like a lethal amount of that. And, you know, he said like, you know, he couldn't, you know, take the, uh, there was just too much pain that he had. Um, so yeah, that is The Painted Bird um, by Jerzy Kaczynski. And I am, I do know, I for, almost forgot that he also wrote um, Being There, and which is probably how I heard of him. Um, Being There was a little bit later. I think he wrote that in the 70s. Which is funny because it was adapted not too long after it was written. Um, that's much shorter work, um, which I have, um, does, I have it in my reading list and I'm, you know, definitely have my eyes on that next, possibly, to read. Um, I hear it's not, it's more of a novella than a, a little bit shorter than this one, but yeah, I'm definitely, I do know that, you know, uh, this, being there's more, you know, seeing the Hal Ashby movie with Peter Sellers and Shirley MacLaine, obviously there's a, I kind of have an understanding of what's going to happen plot-wise, you know, Chauncey Gardner, you know, Chance or Chance the Gardner, is, you know, what's going to happen to him, but I'm still, I think, um, I, I think that that's more of a social commentary, it's like, more on the, you know, on kind of, you know, what happens, like this idea of like, simply for this man to like accrue power, like he, all he has to do is be there, like be there and with these really, really trusting, like overly trusting, um, kind of naive, uh, rich people that while they're quite polite and they're quite, you know, they're accommodating and they're ni you know, nice people, but they just are too trusting of, uh, this guy. And even though, you know, Chauncey Gardner, there's nothing about him. It's like, he's too, is like, you know, his character is just a flat arc. Um, really, the only time you ever see him crying is like, at the end, like expressing any real emotion is when the, uh, is when the, um, I can't remember his name, but I think it was uh, the Benjamin guy, you know, like at the end dies. Um, the, guy, the guy who has like owned the, uh, like the massive financial company. company. Um, but anyway, uh, that would be for a later day. Um, and yeah, that is The Painted Bird by Jersey Kosinski. Thanks for watching.